50 million of them lie embedded in forests, rice paddies, deserts, and ocean surf. They can blow up a battleship, a tank, a platoon, a soldier, but mostly they blow up civilians. Now, landmines on Modern Marvels. Since World War II, an estimated 400 million mines have been deployed on land and sea. In war after war, mines have played a major and sometimes critical role, adding a new dimension to modern combat and establishing themselves as a staple for armies and navies, both big and small. This is a very viable weapon system for all times and all seasons uh, and can be used to not just shape the battlefield, but to have a great psychological effect. If you have a cheap $100 mine, and you have 10 of them and you blow up 10 tanks, maybe that's 30 or $40 million. So on a cost basis, I mean, you, you can see with a landmine is a nice cheap way of defeating a high-tech enemy. They are a useful military tool, and they, otherwise there never would have been so many mines. The problem is, is that post-conflict, dumb anti-personnel mines are going to affect civilian populations. And that's a problem. That's a serious problem. That problem has escalated exponentially in recent decades, as mines have become a weapon of choice on all sides. Rebel groups depend on mines as a cheap way of knocking out big weapons and establishing a presence. And superpowers see mines as a force multiplier, a surrogate soldier that can reduce the need for large armies and thereby save military lives. As a result, some 700 different kinds of land and sea mines have been strewn across vast regions of the planet. Unfortunately, as weapons of chaos and terror, mines do their worst damage long after the fighting is done. They send a blast wave uh, up through your foot into your leg and the tissues around the bone explode off the bone causing damage uh, way up inside the skin and inside the muscle. It's really unspeakable um, actually seeing what landmines do it's something that you can't handle. Um, you can't handle the truth of this disastrous weapon or the culpability that comes from knowing that our tax dollars maim children. Since 1975, more than 500,000 civilians, half of them children, have been killed or maimed by landmines. Tens of millions of live mines remain buried in 70 countries around the world making daily life a game of Russian roulette for two-thirds of the world's poorest nations. Mines stay deadly because they're so simple. The vast majority consist of a fuse that shoots off a spark when stepped on or driven over, setting off a small amount of initiating explosive, which in turn detonates the main charge. As long as the fuse is intact, the mine is alive. How did the planet ever get this way? It's life-giving soil and sea, riddled with so many pockets of mutilation and death. The origin of landmines goes back to the 13th century and China. It only took about a hundred years after the invention of gunpowder for the Chinese to create the world's first exploding mine, called the Underground Sky-Soaring Thunder. Flags, lances, and other attractive items were set in the ground to entice enemy horsemen when one was pulled, it would trigger an igniter attached to the gunpowder charge. Armies throughout Europe tried for centuries to fine-tune the potentially devastating new weapon. But it was an American, a Confederate general by the name of Gabriel Rains, who first put landmines to widespread practical use during the American Civil War. We literally had thousands used in the defense of Richmond in 1864, and they claimed hundreds of casualties. There were even anti-vehicle mines where Confederate cavalry and partisans would place 
anti-vehicle mines on railroad tracks. Uh, there's indications they took out eight or more trains in Tennessee. Anti-vehicle mines packed with 20 or more pounds of explosives were the precursors to the modern anti-tank mine. But Rains also deployed smaller mines aimed at individual soldiers, anti-personnel mines. In fact, the first landmine casualties of the Civil War were inflicted by an anti-personnel mine, which injured a Union scout and killed his horse on May 4, 1862. Rains's rudimentary mines were made in the field from artillery shells that he fused with both pressure and tripwire mechanisms. The pressure mines went off when stepped on. Tripwires detonated the mine when rushed by an arm or leg. Rings's pioneering fuse consisted of a mix of volatile chemicals and ground glass covered by a thin copper cap. When stepped on, the compound ignited, setting off explosives in the ignition channel, which would then detonate the main charge. At first, the fuses were so sensitive, the mines went off virtually on contact. After losing a thumb and forefinger to one of his own mines, however, Rain set the pressure point for detonation at seven pounds. Overall, about 20,000 mines were deployed during the war, killing a few hundred soldiers. From the start, landmines were viewed with abhorrence, at least by the North. This was not the proper way of conducting war. To be blown up by something you can't see doesn't seem fair. But the new weapon once in play proved compelling. And by the end of the war, the North too was using landmines. Half a century later in the First World War, a whole new raft of unfair weapons would be introduced. Everything from poison gas to machine guns to the armored tank. The tank in particular would push the development of landmines. The Germans take artillery shells, much as Rains had done, bury them with forms of friction primers and percussion primers as the means of trying to stop the new weapon on the battlefield called the tank. German mines were improvised in the field using a wood or metal box to hold either a shell or an explosive powder. The pressure fuses were designed to trigger the mines under the weight of a tank or field gun. Some of the mines were booby-trapped to explode if and when the box was opened or moved by enemy deminers. Since tanks didn't appear until late in the war, anti-tank mines did not take center stage as a major weapon. Still, the mines made a deep impression and were responsible for 16% of all American tank losses. Tanks and anti-tank mines continued to square off after the war, as these U.S. Army tests of 1926 show. But peacetime reconstruction eventually put mine research on hold, except in Germany, which began gearing up for war soon after Hitler came to power in 1933. In the history of mine warfare, World War II was a watershed. On every front, in astonishing numbers, with horrifying innovations and designs, landmines took center stage, establishing themselves as both fixture and symbol of 20th century war. Germany, far ahead of everyone in the design and use of landmines, introduced a new mine every three months of the war, baffling the Allies with anti-handling devices, new fuses, and other refinements that made the mines more deadly and harder to detect. Anti-personnel mines were used to keep enemy soldiers from removing anti-tank mines, and both were laid out in minefields, mathematically designed to produce the most casualties. Do you need to have the mine spaced closely enough that a vehicle or a person can't get through without activating a mine, but you can't space them so close together that the detonation of one causes a detonation of another. The Allies quickly learned from the Germans, developing mine-laying drills in which squads of engineers would bury mines at carefully measured distances. 
protect and camouflage the mines with great care. Most of the mines in the war were pressure mines. But tripwires, which extended the effective range of the mine by many feet, were also deployed. The most shocking new anti-personnel mine of the war was undoubtedly the German S mine, short for shrapnel mine, otherwise known to American troops as the Bouncing Betty. Introduced against the French in 1940, the mine was activated by tripwire or footfall. But then the surprise. Instead of exploding from below, a small charge of black powder shot the mine belly high. Then the main charge exploded, sending 350 steel balls in all directions. It was the, the first anti-personnel mine designed to kill large numbers of people. It, it's got a uh, frag pattern with a lethal radius of uh, about 25 meters in a 360 degree pattern. So it was possible for an S mine to kill or wound an entire squad. Many of the wounded and dead were combat engineers who had the nerve-wracking job of sweeping metal detectors across every inch of front in search of mines. That job would become much more hazardous mid-war as the Germans introduced a new mine, one that none of the Allied metal detecting tools could find. One out of every 236 Cambodian civilians has lost a limb by stepping on a landmine. Landmines will return on Modern Marvels. For the contemporary combat engineer, advances in mine sweeping technology haven't improved dramatically since World War II. The critical weapons are the metal detector, the probe, and a whole lot of caution and nerve metal detectors weren't nearly as reliable in World War II, but they still provided the last and best line of defense against stepping on a mine. When you're using a detector, your life, in a way, depends upon it. And you sweep carefully, and you make sure you sweep thoroughly. Jack Wack was a 21-year-old combat engineer assigned to lay and clear mines during the Allied advance through Italy in 1944. When you're sweeping and you uh, get a signal, you immediately freeze and uh, gradually ease to the ground and you gradually start probing horizontally until you feel some metal. Now, once you find it, you gradually, gradually take away the dirt until you expose the top of it. And then you try to look for any trip wires that they booby trap the thing. And then comes the time when you pull it out. The mine that gave combat engineers the most trouble was the German shoe mine, a non-metal mine introduced in 1942 that metal detectors couldn't pick up. You couldn't find the shoe mine, which was a small wooden box and uh, had only one little piece of metal in the whole thing. And with those, uh, when we were searching for mines, that was the single thing we dreaded. Wack lost both legs when he stepped on a shoe mine while clearing debris around a bombed out bridge. When I stepped on the mine, I didn't realize it. There was no indication by the needle, there was no sound, and uh, the first thing I knew was the tremendous roar, and I was up in the air. I knew it was a shoe mine, because just from the amount of the explosion, and uh, and when I laid down and looked, I could see my legs, and I could see just the, just the feet were blown off. I sat there a second, and then I felt this sense of peace. I, uh, I was completely confident that uh, even though I lost two legs, I would lead a normal life. The dozer operator carried me out, and uh, they called for an ambulance, and about a half hour, an ambulance came and took me away. If the Germans had the upper hand in laying mines, the Allies, by necessity, came up with the best tools for rapidly breaching minefields. Pounding the ground with flails that had enough armor to protect the operator while detonating mines was one way. Roller 
Lasers could also be used to set off mines. And plows were employed to clear a path by shoveling mines off to the side. Explosive snakes pushed hundreds of yards across a minefield and then blown up to breach a path wide enough for a tank also saw some action. As did a smaller line charge called the Bangalore Torpedo. The squad pushes the pipe forward across the minefield. Then they put the, the explosive train in the back. They detonate it and it detonates the mines that it's up against. That explosive to explosive continuity causes the mines to detonate. One of the most important mine countermine showdowns of the war took place on D-Day. When American and British troops hit the beaches of Normandy, the first line of German defense was mines. Four million of them along the Atlantic coast. Most were German teller mines, anti-tank pressure mines containing 12 pounds of TNT. Grommel would put wooden sticks in the ground and then attach a teller mine to the top of it, with the idea being that at certain tide levels, the landing craft would come in, hit the teller mine, it would go off and destroy the landing craft. One of the things not usually appreciated about D-Day is that American engineers constituted 40 to 50 percent of the initial landing effort. So it was a major effort. And one of the reasons we had so many problems on Omaha is we didn't get many of the lanes open so that we could then land tanks and other heavy equipment to help us deal with the defenses. And we suffered heavy casualties. About a year after D-Day, World War II was over. But just a few years later, mines were once again being put into the earth in large numbers, this time in Korea. Korea's craggy mountainous terrain made anti-tank mines much more efficient, since tanks were more or less forced to go along predictable paths. Just 80 anti-tank mines were used for every U.S. tank destroyed, compared to 2,000 mines per tank in the Second World War. Anti-personnel mines weren't so effective, at least not as a deterrent to enemy movement, since the Koreans were willing to use human wave tactics to breach a minefield. As a result, the U.S. developed a new kind of mine, a directional fragmentation mine, that would make such assaults completely suicidal. The mining equivalent of a sawed-off shotgun, the Claymore mine could be fired by tripwire, or electrically by remote control. It could spew 700 steel balls in whatever direction it was aimed, with a wounding range of 50 yards. Being able to aim the mine made it a much more efficient weapon. You can point it in the direction that your enemy is coming from. Uh, a bouncing Betty will spread shrapnel in 360 degree arc, so it will shoot shrapnel everywhere. The directional mine, theoretically, the bad stuff only goes toward the enemy. Another highly influential anti-personnel mine devised during the Cold War was the M14. This 1.5-inch high-pressure mine launched the era of small, cheap anti-personnel mines that could be mass-produced for a few dollars apiece. Nicknamed the toe popper because of its size and intended effect, it conspicuously turned the anti-personnel mine into a mine that was designed to maim. Made primarily of plastic, it was also extremely difficult to track down. It has essentially every evil property that a landmine can have. And because we made them, then the rest of the world thought, well, maybe that's a great idea. If they're doing it, we should do it too. So the Chinese made the Type 72A, and they've probably made more than 100 million of those, just a colossal number. And that mine has probably killed and injured more people than any other mine type in history, the, the, the Type 72A, which is a takeoff on the uh, US M14. The ingenuity behind the M14 had to do with its size and firing mechanism. When stepped on, a flexible convex plate called a Belleville spring would snap into reverse, driving a firing pin into the detonator. This action would ignite a friction-sensitive explosive in the detonator, which in turn set off the main charge. The tiny packet of 29 grams of tetral was just enough to mutilate a leg from the knee down. 
If the global tensions of the 1950s spurred the development of efficient new mines, the war in Vietnam would usher in another generation of mines with evil properties. Mines that could be dropped by the thousands from the sky. Nearly 100 million landmines were cleared from Europe and North Africa between 1945 and 1949, mostly by German POWs. Landmines will return on Modern Marvels. Mines played a bloody and pervasive role in Vietnam, where anti-personnel mines in particular were used by both sides in devastating new ways. Vietnam was an unconventional war with an enemy and a front that was hard to define. Hit-and-run guerrilla tactics made traditional mines and minefields obsolete. It wasn't like World War II, where there was a front, and the front moved forward or the front moved back. In Vietnam, it wasn't possible to predict where the conflict was going to be, which meant that where you didn't want the enemy to come today, you might want to be able to go tomorrow. Now, if you put down persistent landmines, you can't do that. And we found that out the hard way. A lot of our own troops were injured or killed by those mines. A lot of civilians, too. The North Vietnamese employed landmines in a radically new and aggressive way. Instead of using minefields to slow down or redirect enemy troops and tanks, they deployed mines as an offensive weapon the primary aim of which was to inflict casualties. 33% of all marine injuries and deaths in Vietnam were caused by mines. The North used Chinese and Soviet mines, but relied heavily on redeployed U.S. mines like this M16 Claymore, and on mines they could fashion from the litter of the battlefield. They'd go out, and if we dropped a bomb somewhere or some kind of a, a round, uh, they were able to crack it open and take the explosive out and, you know, kind of melt it to where they can re-pour it and they'd put it in a metal casing or they would put it in a mold, a form, you know, wood. They were ingenious in, in how um, to make them go off as well as, you know, ma manufacture them. They camouflaged it to where... Uh, you and I were not able to find them. American troops also deployed mines, some 80,000 claymores a month during the height of the war. But planting mines by hand left GIs vulnerable to sniper fire. And by the time a minefield was in place, it could be obsolete, the battle having moved on. To get around these problems, the U.S. came up with a revolutionary new kind of mine that could follow the flow of the battle, the scatterable. The Blue 42 Dragon Tooth was even smaller and lighter than the Toe Popper. Encased in hard plastic, it could be dropped by the thousands in minutes from the air. When stepped on, volatile chemicals in the 13 millimeter long mine mixed, setting off a blast that could tear off a foot. Scatterables were dumped over Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam in hope of crippling North Vietnamese supply lines. But the new mines had a major drawback. Their ease of deployment made them impossible to map. The era of carefully laid and recorded minefields was over, which meant that U.S. troops didn't always know where their own mines were. If you were smart, you really would hesitate about using those mines in Vietnam because you wouldn't know when your own troops might need to go through exactly that same area, but they wouldn't be able to without very time-consuming uh, mine bre breaching process. The Soviets quickly came out with their own scatterable, the PF-1 butterfly mine, so-called because of the way it floats to the ground. They deployed millions in the 1980s in Afghanistan. The humanitarian landmine crisis of today largely stems from the use of such mines. After Vietnam, the U.S. was determined to come up with a new, improved generation of scatterables. And in 1978, the family of scatterable mines, FASCAM for short, was introduced. What made FASCAM mines different was their ability to self-destruct after a few hours or days, making them more suitable for the twists and turns of guerrilla warfare. The mines could be deployed by plane, 
artillery, or land vehicle. There was even a minefield and a briefcase for the foot soldier that could shoot out 17 anti-tank and four anti-personnel mines to a radius of 35 yards. Smart mines, as they were called, used simple digital timers, like those found in an ordinary wristwatch, that would complete an electric circuit after a few hours or days and explode the mine. Ironically, the humanitarian potential of mines that could turn themselves on and off and blow themselves up was not a factor in their design. The emergence of self-destructing mines was motivated entirely by military considerations. It's just serendipitous that they turned out to be an immense humanitarian advance. I mean, really immense. Uh, the lethal duration of a modern mine is about, on, on the average, about 64,000 times less than that of a traditional persistent mine. But it's unclear how reliable fast cam mines are. Estimates for their failure rate range from 0.1 to 5%. More fundamentally, Fast cams may actually perpetuate the use of dumb mines by poorer militaries and insurgent forces. Only advanced modern militaries are going to be able to afford to design, build, and field them. So if advanced militaries get them, the lesser developed countries will want to retain long-lasting mines as a countervailing measure. Certainly rebel troops and small armies won't be able to afford vast quantities of the $120 Adam or area denial artillery mine which can be dropped from the sky or shot out of a gun, and which self-deploys seven 20-foot tripwires upon landing. Or the $114,000 wide-area anti-armor munitions mine, otherwise known as WAM, a mine that uses multiple sensors and a penetrating warhead to detect and take out an enemy tank from a distance of 100 yards. Even greater distances and levels of lethality are routine for sea mines, which have also established themselves as a staple of modern war and spawned whole new forms of mine and countermine technology. During the Vietnam War, the U.S. dumped about a thousand tons of gravel mines, anti-personnel scatterables, about the size and shape of a sugar packet. Landmines will return on Modern Marvels. Mine warfare is not restricted to combat on land. Sea mines have also had a huge impact on 19th and 20th century conflicts. Indeed, sea mines have damaged and destroyed more ships than any other weapon in every war since the Civil War. The USS Roberts found out the hard way how devastating a single sea mine can be when it hit an Iranian M08 mine while patrolling the Persian Gulf on July 4th 1989. This explosion was one of the most ferocious I'd ever seen. Um, it actually blew the ship vertically about 15 or 20 feet in the air. A fireball went up from the after end of the ship that must have been somewhere between 100 and 150 feet. I was standing 114 feet, 120 feet from the point of the explosion. It broke my left foot. The old-fashioned contact mine, packed with 250 pounds of TNT, nearly cracked the Roberts in half. The only thing holding it together was the deck. Interestingly, it wasn't the TNT directly that caused the enormous damage. A mine causes what they, a balloon, a, almost a force balloon under the ship. And that force balloon then comes up and bursts under the ship and lifts it up out of the water. And when it releases the pressure, it's the falling back into the water after being lifted that causes the ship to break its back and, and usually go right to the bottom. Visions of such spectacular destruction in which a cheap explosive wipes out the enemy's most expensive ship inspired the development of sea mines from the start. David Bushnell, an American student at Yale who invented the submarine during the Revolutionary War, also designed and built the first sea mine. Known as a keg mine, this simple contact mine was made by packing a wooden butter keg with gunpowder and attaching it to a float. A hammer and flintlock mechanism, like that on a musket, was attached to the mine, which was triggered when hit by a ship. 
Germans failed to knock out any British vessels. Their only victims? Two boys who tried to fish out one of the kegs. Mortar mines proved much more effective in the Civil War, when the South used them as a great equalizer against the North, sinking or damaging some 43 Union ships. The South offered half the cargo of a sunken ship to anyone who could design an effective mine, or torpedo as they were then called. Some of the designs were a little better than the keg mine. They actually used a container that was originally intended for whiskey, five-gallon container, packed it with black gunpowder, put an artillery friction piece in it, and then suspended it below a float. And one of the Union vessels stumbled upon it, went down in 30 feet of water. Only thing showing was the smokestacks. Not all mines were so rudimentary. The Singer mine, a moored contact mine invented by the brother of the sewing machine magnate, used a spring-driven plunger that set off a 60-pound black powder charge. A more radical innovation was the introduction of electrical fuses. They actually had electrical controllers on the shore when uh, the ship passed closest to the mine, then a well-hidden shore contingent would set the switch and cause the mine to detonate. The laying of mines on the open sea didn't begin until the 20th century. Most dramatically in the First World War, when the U.S. and British planted 72,000 mines along the North Atlantic coast in an attempt to bottle up the German U-boat. The North Sea Barrage, as it was called, was the largest underwater minefield ever deployed. It featured an innovative new mine developed by the U.S., called the MK-6, that used a floating copper wire to extend the contact range of the mine by 300%. Any submarine that grazed the wire would trigger the mine's 300-pound charge. Late in the last year of the war, the spectacular blockade destroyed at least six German subs and forced the rest of the U-boat fleet into time-consuming evasive maneuvers. Sea mines played a more pervasive and lethal role in World War II, in large part because they were more sophisticated and deadly. Old-fashioned contact mines were displaced by stealthier influence mines, which could now be dropped from the air, could lurk at the bottom of the sea, and were triggered by magnetic or acoustic sensors. The sensors could detect the mere noise or magnetic charge or change in water pressure caused by a ship passing hundreds of feet above, thereby setting off the mine. Influence mines were much harder to sweep and took a vast toll on all sides. The Germans and Japanese alone lost some 2,700 ships to mines, one for every 37 mines that were laid. As with landmines, sea mines posed a major problem on D-Day, and the largest mine-sweeping armada ever assembled cleared mines out of the English Channel on the night of June 5th, just prior to the attack. There were some uh, 250 ships in the lead of the, the D-Day armada that were dedicated to clearing the lanes across the channel. The first casualties of that operation occurred with loss of minesweeping. The mine-sweeping ships dragged cable cutters through the channel to slice through the lines that held the moored mines in place. They also towed electrical cables that could simulate the magnetic charge of a passing ship and thereby detonate magnetic mines. The effort that we went through cutting the cables to the mines and, and allowing our gunboats to sink them when they surfaced was a tremendous effort and uh, had to proceed any, any landing uh, to prevent serious loss. Mine sweeping has come a long way since the Second World War. Much of the work is now done by the Navy's MH-53E helicopters, which are strong enough to drag mine detectors and cable cutters through the waves and can do so more quickly and safely than ships. Divers still have to hunt down the hard-to-find mines, but a whole new generation of high-tech mine hunting tools is about to emerge, or submerge. We're trying to get people out of the loop from dealing with the, uh, the mine net problem. So we're uh, concentrating a great deal of effort on using unmanned systems, or basically robots, to, uh, to, to, ch to help with this mine uh, problem. Unmanned underwater vehicles are likely to be the minesweepers of the future. 
supplementing operations from ship and air. Equipped with cameras, sophisticated sensors, and robot appendages, some of the UUVs are programmed to find and recover mines. Others carry explosives, which they drop on mines at the bottom of the sea. For shallow water sweeps, crawlers that look like mini tanks are engineered to handle the complex dynamics of breaking waves. The Rapid Airborne Mine Clearance System, or RAMEX, meanwhile, may provide another interesting way of getting rid of underwater mines by literally shooting them into extinction with bullets designed to stay on course after they hit the water. It does that by having a projectile that creates its own cavity as it passes through the water so that it isn't slowed down okay, by the water uh, like a conventional bullet. Getting rid of mines in the surf zone is a job for the Navy's experimental explosive nets and line charges, which use blast pressure to detonate mines. Unfortunately, such heavy-handed methods can't eliminate 100% of the mines. And while that's okay for clearing a path in combat, it's worthless when it comes to reclaiming land for civilian use. The humanitarian demining kit of the 21st century requires an altogether different set of mine hunting tools. Most landmines cost between three and thirty dollars to make and between three hundred and a thousand dollars to clear. Landmines will return on Modern Marvels. Putting landmines on or in the ground is a whole lot easier than getting them out especially after a war, when an area has to be totally demined in order to be ready for civilian use. Would you send your children to play soccer in a field that they said, we think we got 99% of them? Absolutely not. Adding to the challenge is the fact that deminers face a mind-boggling range of mines, including many that are booby-trapped to explode when lifted. The U.S. State Department's humanitarian demining program puts out a pack of 52 mine cards per country, like this one for Bosnia, that alert deminers to major mines. The best post-conflict demining tool after the metal detector and the probe, which have been in use since World War II, is a mine-sweeping dog. Hundreds of Belgian and German shepherds, trained to smell explosives and immediately signal a mine, are at work in the minefields of Europe, Africa, Asia, and South America. Demining dogs cost around $16,000, however, and can't work in wind, which confuses their sense of scent. Another critical part of the demining toolkit that is making life safer for those on the front lines is personal protection equipment, like this full body suit designed by med engineers in Canada that was blast tested against a full range of anti-personnel mines. If you're not wearing any PPE and a mine goes off, you're going to be dismembered. But if you're wearing PPE, upper body protection, lower body protection, maybe foot protection, hopefully you're going to minimize the injury enough so that the medical attention that's there can save your life and maybe give you something to walk on. Unfortunately, blast-resistant visors, vests, and boots cost thousands of dollars and are too expensive for most deminers in the third world. Also prohibitively expensive for much of the world are the latest demining vehicles, spin-offs of the old rollers and plows, like this 56-ton Rhino Earth Tiller, which dredges and detonates mines by crushing them between its upper and lower drums. Or this floating mine blade, a remotely operated bulldozer with teeth that dig 10 inches into the ground and separate earth from mine. Aerial mine clearing is a promising technology that might be available in a few years. A camcopter in development by the U.S. Army uses onboard GPS and infrared sensors that can read the heat signature of a landmine and thereby create a digital mine map of a given piece of land. The map can then be used by deminers to track down mines. Still more creative approaches include the use of bees, equipped with tiny radio packs and trained to scent out mines. And something called purple grass, 
a weed that would change color when close to a mine. Despite these prospects, experts say it is highly unlikely that we'll ever develop a technology that makes demining easy and safe. There are so many different mines, so many different types of soil, so many different environmental circumstances, that there is no one silver bullet that's going to solve the problem at once. The problem, of course, will never be solved as long as people keep putting more mines into the ground than they can take out. This still appears to be what's happening. Humanitarian deminers have cleared nearly 3,500 square miles of land worldwide. But feuding countries with bitter border disputes, like Pakistan and India, have deployed millions of new mines. Meanwhile, the civilian casualty count from post-war mines continues to mount. 15 to 20,000 new victims every year. For obvious reasons, that's a reality that's hard for most Americans to really understand. I think all it would take is a few landmines, God forbid, planted on uh, town squares and commons uh, in New England or the Midwest to drive it home, that we need to ban this awful, insidious weapon of mass destruction. Jerry White lost his right leg when he stepped on a landmine while visiting Israel as a student in 1984. The mine had been laid 17 years earlier, during the 1967 Arab-Israeli War. One beautiful spring day in 1984, I was hiking down the side of a hillside and boom, the world exploded all around me. My lower right leg had been blown off and was rather shredded and my left leg was blown open with my bones showing and in fact um, bones from one of my feet had um, become arrows into my second leg. White was told that stepping on a mine was an anomaly, a freak occurrence. But the more he investigated, the more he discovered that his experience was far from rare. It wasn't just Israel. That wasn't the most mine-affected country in the world. It was Bosnia. It was Cambodia. It was Angola. It was all these countries that were uh, in the middle of civil war or emerging from civil war, where you saw massive casualties, hundreds per month in some cases. So it was really taking and doing the math. White, co-founder of the Landmine Survivors Network, has been part of a humanitarian grassroots movement to ban anti-personnel landmines worldwide. Launched in 1992, the international campaign has achieved unprecedented success as an initiative fueled entirely by non-governmental organizations. To date, 134 countries have signed the landmark treaty. The United States, Russia, and China have not. These indiscriminate killers constitute one of the greatest public health hazards. Royal celebrities like Queen Noor of Jordan and Princess Diana before her death in 1997 brought massive attention to an issue that struck a humanitarian chord worldwide. Even Superman and Wonder Woman have done their part, warning children in third world countries about the dangers of mines. I think the success of the movement to ban landmines is largely based on a visceral understanding that a weapon planted and hidden in the ground that is meant to maim and rip off body parts and does this to children and women and innocent civilians every single day is just plain wrong. Weapons of war, of course, are supposed to maim and rip off body parts. Which is precisely why landmines will probably continue to wreak havoc in war and beyond war for many years to come. Some heroes with the right stuff never left the ground. If we didn't come up with some answers, this crew might not come back to Earth. Failure is not an option. Sunday night, August 24th at 9, only on the History Channel. Even astronauts have heroes.